Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Jason G and I'm a men member of the Student Advisory Committee and co-chair of the Fellows and Study Groups program here at the Institute of Politics. And my name is Emily Hall, also a member of the Student Advisory Committee and co-chair of the Fellows and Study Groups program. Before we begin, note the exit doors located both on the park side and the JFK Street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight by tweeting with the hashtag IOPFellows, which is also listed in your program. Tonight's forum is an opportunity to hear perspectives from the Fall 2016 Institute of Politics Resident Fellows on a variety of current political issues and how they will address some of these issues in their study groups this semester. The discussion will be moderated by IOP strategic advisor and former Washington Post reporter, Lois Romano. Members of this semester's resident fellows class are Johannes Abraham, former senior advisor to the National Economic Council and chief of staff to Valerie Jarrett, Dan Balls, chief correspondent for the Washington Post, Jason Chaffetz, former congressman from Utah and chairman of the House Oversight Committee. Karen Finney, former senior advisor and spokesperson for Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. Sally Jewell, former secretary of the interior under President Obama. And finally, Mark Strand, pr the president of the Congressional Institute. Please join me in welcoming our guests to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Lois Romano, and thank you all for coming to hear this remarkable group of IOP fellows. Um, we have on the stage represented a group of people who have really experienced almost every sector of public life, from Congress to uh, corporate to the cabinet to campaigns to journalism. And what I want to do is, is sort of dive right into um, current events and, and talk about some of the dysfunction that's going on in the government. And as we do that, I'm hoping that they will share a little bit about what they're going to be talking about in their study groups. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is DACA. We had a remarkable policy shift uh, at the beginning of the week where the president um, announced that he was shifting the policy that protects 800,000 uh, young children who were brought here as immigrants. Um, and he's going to give Congress six months to see if they can fix it. So I'm going to start with Congressman Chaffetz, who, by the way, apologizes because he does have to leave a little bit early today. Um, but the congressman tells us that he left Congress in part because he was frustrated that things weren't getting done. So I'm going to ask you, is Congress going to tackle DACA? <laughs> yeah, that's easy. We're going to get that stuff done early. That's, that's, uh, those are the easy ones. Uh, listen. Uh, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for, for having us here and for being invited and being part of the Harvard community here for the next uh, few months. Uh, best advice I ever got when I, when I got to Congress was from uh, actually Speaker John Boehner, and he said, you know what, you can disagree, just don't be disagreeable. Don't be that person. And, and to have the uh, array of, of opinions that we're going to talk about here, I think is an important part of the dialogue. So. I'm going to go ahead and guess that a lot of you won't necessarily agree with me on several things, but I think it's important that we have that dialogue and we actually think through these answers because uh, I had to really kind of digest the, the DACA answer, uh, and this may surprise you, uh, but I think it's actually uh, one of the better things that President Trump has done, and this is why. My first, I was elected the same time that Barack Obama was elected, okay, 2008. Uh, I got assigned to the Judiciary Committee. I'm not a member of I, I'm not an attorney. I said, Mr. Speaker, I, you know, he's now, now, he wasn't the speaker at the time, but I, I you know, I said, Mr. Boehner, I, I'm not an attorney. You want me to be on judiciary? He said, exactly. We need some people that aren't attorneys on, on judiciary. I proactively asked to get on the immigration subcommittee because I campaigned on the idea that we need to fix legal immigration. I don't care how far big and wide your wall is. If you don't fix legal immigration, you never ever solve this problem. So I actually wanted to be there. With all due respect, the facts are 
Democrats had the House, the Senate, and the presidency. That subcommittee on judiciary had two meetings in two years on this topic. One was to take a photo, and the other was to have Stephen Colbert come testify. That's all the Democrats did on immigration when they had all the levers of power. And I asked to get off that committee. I said, you don't do anything. Now, I'm terribly frustrated that Congress hasn't done other things on immigration. There's but one bill that did pass. It was my bill. 385 votes. 385 votes. It didn't solve everything in immigration, but it got rid of the per country caps. It doubled the number of available visas on family-based visas. It would have helped hundreds of thousands of people, and it was as bipartisan as it could possibly be. And guess what? Word came back. The president and, the, and Harry Reid, they're not going to let a Republican have a victory on immigration before the 2012 uh, election. It's not going to happen. Your bill's going nowhere. And that's the reality. So DACA comes into place, I think it was June or July of 2012, and um, the president put it in there, President Obama, for a short period of time. What I see President Trump doing, though, is dealing with the reality that 10 states were going to actually uh, file a suit. The previous lawsuit had been successful. I think, at least as best I could tell, the president would actually, President Trump would actually like to keep legal status for the so-called dreamers. And this Congress hopefully will act on a deadline. I never see Congress move unless there's an actual deadline. My hope, my prayer, is that they'll take that six months, they'll work on locking down the border, they'll work on dealing with the dreamers, and they'll work on getting legal immigration fixed. So I have more optimism than I had two weeks ago that they're actually gonna address one of the biggest things that's coming before this nation. I hope so. Well, that's very optimistic, and with all due respect, your party has not done anything, even though they own the government. They've had a lot of trouble getting things passed. So with that, Mark. Well, wait, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. I, I want to address that. Okay. The House of Representatives has more than 200 bills that they've passed in this Congress that are sitting in the United States Senate. And you're right. I was very critical of the Democrats when they had the House and Senate and the presidency, and they didn't get certain things done. And now that pendulum has swung and they have got to get this done. And tax reform, health care, I mean, you name it, yeah, there's a lot that still needs to get done. <laughs> uh, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure, go ahead. I don't think it's going to come as a galloping shock to anyone that... Uh, just identify yourself. So I'm Johannes Abraham. Uh, worked in the White House. Formerly in the Obama White House. Can folks hear yeah. me? Is mic on? Maybe move, yeah. Okay. Not on. Any better? Here. No, it's right, what if I, Can folks hear me if I do this? Mine's on. <laughs> well, the good thing is that gave me there a little time go. to calm down. Um, and yeah, I'm going to let you take this one. And I, you know, I don't think it's going to come as a galloping shock to anyone in the room uh, that Jason and I have a different memory of uh, the yeah. previous eight years. I think a couple things are important to note. Um, the first is the democratically held Congress uh, for the first two years of the President's administration actually was remarkably productive. Uh, we can't forget that we inherited as a uh, unified government uh, absolute financial crisis uh, that was managed and helped uh, partially managed by the stimulus bill. Um, the Affordable Care Act was passed and there was a whole bevy of legislation that moved, of priority legislation that moved in those two years. So I think it actually be, I think it's just sort of, regardless of how you feel about any of the individual pieces of legislation, it's just sort of factually inaccurate to point to those two years of government is unproductive. I, 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 you know, I would sort of challenge someone to, again, even if you don't agree with the underlying policies, to point to that Congress as unproductive, particularly with respect and in relation to the Congress that we see right now, I, I don't think that's a, a fair assessment to make. As it relates to immigration, just a, a couple of facts that are, are, are worth mentioning in, in DACA and immig specifically in immigration writ large. After the 2010 midterms, so before the 2012 election, after the 2010 midterms, Republicans, failed to pass the DREAM Act. Part of the reason that Trump has an, something to rescind as the executive is because Republicans in the Senate refused to pass the DREAM Act. That's fact. During the lame duck session after the 2010 midterm, Republicans in the Senate refused to pass the DREAM Act. Let's look at another set of facts. After the 2012 election, um, and I apologize for some of the false advertising about this event, there's a picture of me 
uh, that went around that showed me a lot younger. Uh, it was before some of these, <laughs> it was taken in 2013 before some of these debates happened, so. Um, we still have gray hair? A after, I have, don't have gray hair, but I have less hair. After, uh, after President Obama was reelected, we were all really hopeful that we would get something done on immigration. And actually, the United States Senate did act. And senators like Marco Rubio did pass a bill that wasn't perfect, but did take a lot of steps to fixing our broken immigration system. The Republican-held House of Representatives did nothing. It's not that they voted it down. I can stand losing if I get a shot. They did nothing. It never got a vote. So I, it, I just think it, 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 it stretches credibility to, to pin the lack of congressional action on immigration on Democrats. And um, now in terms of my optimism, and on this we, we disagree as well, um, you know, I, I, it, I, I find it hard to believe that uh, Republican held House and Senate are, are gonna act on this, but, and if they do act, I think it's important for us to hold them accountable to act on the issue at hand, which is these dreamers, and not tack on a whole set of, you know, sort of ancillary side projects as it relates to immigration that have nothing to do with the injustice that's been done. Now, I'll pass the mic back. All right, no, I, wanna go, I wanna go to Mark right now. Mark is the president of the Congressional Institute and is very well acquainted with Congress and is going to do a study group on the dysfunction of Congress. Are they gonna pass DOC in six months? Boy, this is a, a wonderful illustration of exactly what uh, my study group's about. Because whether you're a Republican or Democrat, you should care whether or not Congress works. Yeah. And because the, the founders designed our system to make sure there was no power concentrated in any one branch of government so that you know, we could diffuse power. So the inefficiency of our government is kind of a feature, not a flaw. But at the same time, they still wanted a government that worked. And the reason why presidents have been acting increasingly on their own through executive orders is the failure of Congress to enact legislation. And that's Republican Congresses and Democrat Congresses. Uh, there's plenty of blame to go around for both sides on the immigration debate. Uh, some people wanted only a comprehensive solution. Some people wanted, you know, a partial solution. But that's strategy. The question is, you know, if Congress is unable to act, power will keep shifting to the executive. Now, people feel that's great when the executive is from their party. But what happens when the executive is from the other party? Uh, the checks and balances of our system is what keeps our democracy healthy. And yet, through all of history, the tide has always turned against legislatures and towards the executive. And we have to believe, we, we can't believe that we're exempt from history. Uh, so it's in everyone's interest for Congress to get stronger. Now, dealing with DACA directly, it's a challenge because I worry about whether or not Congress will do this. Paul Ryan is strongly in favor of, of passing a DACA legislation. Uh, you know, Eric Cantor before him was strong. I mean, there have been a lot of Republicans who've been strong on this issue, but there are a lot of Republicans who aren't strong. Now, can they? for instance, not go to the Hastert rule, which is the majority, the majority has to support the bill, and allow a coalition of like-minded people from both parties to pass legislation. It's a big challenge. Uh, I, I think Paul Ryan believes it enough that he's gonna try to get it through. I think Donald Trump will encourage whatever influence he still has in his own party, um, because apparently he has all the influence in the other party as of yesterday. <laughs> um, whatever influence, I think he will urge people to support it too. So I think that, it should pass, but I will, be, I will not be relieved until the day it does. And I think, uh, so it's, it's one of those issues that should happen. It's a test of Congress to see whether or not it still works. All right, and now I'm gonna go to a neutral observer, my former <laughs> colleague, <laughs> Dan Balls, who is the Dean of the Political Press Corps. Um, if they don't pass it, what is gonna be the political ramifications in the 2018 midterms for the Republican Party? Well, I mean, uh, on, the, on the surface, you would say it's gonna be damaging to the Republican Party if this is not resolved in, resolved in a way that's helpful to the dreamers. Um, the only caveat I would throw into that is that these issues come and go so quickly now. I mean, one of the things about modern politics is today's you know, hot issue is tomorrow's you know, memory, barely. People, people move on so quickly. So. Um, when the, when the government got shut down in 2013, Republicans were warned, this is gonna be the death of Republicans in the 2014 election. And a year later, they had a big victory. Uh, so we will all write things in, in the moment of, of this debate 
uh, projecting out what seems to be a logical conclusion in terms of the political impact. But we don't know what's going to happen in the interim, you know, seven, six, eight, nine months before the election. But, uh, you know, the, Im the immigration issue, if you step back from it longer, is an issue that has bedeviled the Republican Party for more than a decade. I mean, George W. Bush pushed hard for a comprehensive immigration bill. And a number of people in the Senate, in particular, worked to try to get that done. Um, but it was Republican opposition and the divisions within the Republican Party that prevented it. Um, you know, Mark just talked about the Hastert rule. The Hastert rule says if you're, you, know, you, sh you should not take a bill to the floor if the majority of your party, if you're in control, doesn't support it. Um, if the Republicans had been willing to set aside that rule previously, as Johannes said, an immigration bill could have been passed in the House along with what the Senate had done with a coalition of some Republicans and actually many more Democrats. Um, but it is, it is the nature of the politics that we're in today, and this is actually one of the things we're going to be dealing with in, in my study group. It's the nature of politics today um, that the concerns, the worries, the fears in both parties, and particularly in the Republican Party, are challenges from the right and primary challenges. And so it's much more difficult to break out and to do compromise um, cooperation in the way that once took place. Karen Finney? So I guess the concern that I have is, you know, it's, it's really a shame, as Dan said, that it didn't get done during George W. Bush's time, because I think part of the problem, remember that at one point the Republican Party said, this is obviously pre-Donald Trump, that it was going to reach out to minorities and, you know, reach out to women and be more welcoming. And then they threw that playbook out in the last election. And I just keep thinking about Charlottesville and what we saw. And I just keep thinking about something that we talked a lot about in our and during the campaign, which is uh, the way that President Trump really tried to appeal to the lowest common denominator, to the worst of our instincts. He race baited, he scapegoated, and said, you know, those people are taking your jobs and they're ruining your lives and they're ruining our country. And he did it with a number of black and brown uh, people in this country. And so I think the only way uh, I don't think immigra if, they, if we don't get immigration reform passed, uh, it's going to be a, a cost to the Republicans uh, in the 2018 midterms, unless, and I think even with gerrymandering, frankly, it's probably not possible unless people come out and vote. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about in my study group is the activism, because I think what people are realizing now in the aftermath of 2016, you know, I don't really care if you like Hillary or not. Elections have consequences, right? And I think we're learning more about the, the impact uh, of this presidency. Uh, and I think it is really challenging us to challenge ourselves and our values in a way that I don't know that people were really paying attention during the 2016 election. So the concern that I have in looking at sort of the demographic trends in this country um, is it, the way that the, the deck is sort of stacked at this point, and particularly if you look at that 30% that still is very much in support of President Trump, those are a lot of the voters that I think most Republicans are counting on in the 2018 elections. And I worked for a chairman of the DNC, Howard Dean, in 2005, who tried to sound the alarm that we should have been paying attention to redistricting in 2010, and nobody had time for it. And I think now, again, people are starting to realize these things have consequences, and now they're looking to 2020. So I think there are a couple of forces that are working against creating the political pressure that I would like to see on Republicans uh, to get this done, um, because I just don't think there are enough districts in the country where people, even if we have high voter turnout, which I hope we do in 2018, because I think it sends a really important message, but I think the way the deck is stacked, it's still gonna probably not be enough in enough places. So I don't think, and I'm sorry, th these days I don't think Congress has a lot of courage. I just don't. I think we're too polarized, and I think part of what's broken in the system is that there, it's not set up to reward courage. And I think that's a pro and it's not set up anymore to reward working together, and that's part of what we have to get past. I'm going to shift gears here. Um, we have with us Sally Jewell, the former Secretary of the Interior, who was also the CEO of REI, which we love. 
Um, and <laughs> um, we have all watched President Trump try to run the country like he ran his company, which is just to do what he says. It's not working. We've seen him thwarted, and we've seen him become frustrated. What's he missing here? You've run an agency and a company. Tell us the difference and what, what he's not doing. <laughs> Government is not a business. And uh, having done run a business and run part of government, running a business is much, much easier. <laughs> Way easier. The rule book is clear. Um, and even though I don't think you run a successful business by telling people what to do necessarily, uh, you do run a you, you know when your business is successful because of your your bottom line, your employee satisfaction, your customer satisfaction, your shareholder value. There are measures that are out there that are very tangible. You also have the ability to control your destiny. Your budget is sensible, right? You you uh, may take a look at a long-term strategic plan, and the first year of that may be your first budget year, and. Uh, you go to your board of directors and you pass a budget and you know what you can invest in. Or if you're upgrading your systems or replacing buildings, you can plan for that. You can plan for depreciation. The government, um, and, and I used to say as Secretary of the Interior that you know, it was an awakening, I guess, very early on that I'm in the forever business here. My job is overseeing 20% uh, of the nation's land mineral resources in the Outer Continental Shelf offshore, um, making sure that we have land and water and wildlife and habitat for generations to come. Uh, the Endangered Species Act, making sure that we aren't making decisions that are undermining the habitat necessary to have species diversity, that's law. Um, overseeing people's connection to the natural world through places like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and wildlife refuges or national parks, balancing multiple use on public lands with sustained yields, so grazing, mining, oil and gas, renewable energy, transmission lines, and those are difficult decisions. So uh, one of the interesting intersections, and I'll be exploring this in, my, in one particular session of my study group, which is government's not a business, running a business is a lot easier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sounds familiar? Uh, is, is going to be actually um, examining why it is important for government to be more difficult to run, to be less efficient, and, and Mark said it a little bit earlier, it's not designed to be efficient, it's designed actually to represent the public and to take public information from a variety of sources. So uh, if you are, for example, um, in a community and you for years have been using public lands, you begin to feel that they're your public lands, but actually they belong to all Americans. So you're gonna have a point of view that is related to your perception. You know, where you stand depends on where you sit. Um, or where you sit depends on where you stand, whatever. You know what I mean. <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> one, one, it works one way or the other. Um, but the job is not just to represent the local community that is close to those public lands. It's actually to represent all of the interests. And that's much more difficult. You have to hold uh, public meetings. You have to have hearings. You have to make sure you're um, supporting the National Environmental Policy Act. And I started my career in oil and gas. I was a petroleum engineer for mobile oil in southern Oklahoma and in Colorado. And businesses, for the most part, don't mind playing by the rules. What drives businesses crazy, and frankly drives shareholder crazy, is uncertainty. So if a regulator, the Department of the Interior does that, other federal agencies do that, gets a lot of input, including from industry, that says, you know, we are concerned about air quality, water quality, uh, the impact on endangered species. And you work together saying, how can we achieve your objective, which drives the economy, but also do it in a way that sustains the environment? Um, and businesses generally are very willing to sign up for that and very willing to abide by those rules. They just don't want the rules changing when there's a new guy in the White House new Secretary of the Interior, um, they're looking for certainty and predictability. And um, one of my good friends, Bill Ruckelshaus, first ever head of the EPA, one of the reasons I have this job actually, he served Richard Nixon and then later uh, Ronald Reagan as uh, head of the EPA. 
And um, he's really uh, responsible as the head of the EPA for implementing the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. And things are a lot cleaner for those of us with gray hair than they used to be. And that's the kind of thoughtful regulation we need. So I'll be talking about that and also other aspects of our democracy that I worked with from tribes to government at every level, local and uh, all the way up through federal to nonprofit organizations, why getting sued is good sometimes in terms of clarifying the law. I never thought that way as a business person, but I understand it more. Uh, citizen activism, one of my guests will be uh, Dave Archambo, the uh, chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe over the Dakota Access Pipeline. So we'll be talking about that intersection between um, strong economy and businesses are associated with that and a sustainable environment that we're proud to leave to future generations. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, tell you all that in a few minutes, I'm going to ask uh, maybe one or two questions. We're going to go to questions from you all. And there are four microphones um, that you should line up at, one, two, three, four. And we'll just kind of go in a circle. Um, so start thinking about that. Um, uh, the last question I want to ask you all is, is remarkably, after 10 months, um, we're, we're still um, litigating how Donald Trump won and, and, and how Hillary lost. And, and mostly the, the candidates themselves are still doing it. Um, Donald Trump can't get over it. And, and I will tell you this, in his office, if you go to visit him, he hands out the electoral map as a party favor. Um, and now Hillary's book is coming out, and she has some new answers or excuses or reasons why she lost. So um, I would venture to gain that these six people, um, guests that have all different explanations and, and theories, so I'm going to start with Congressman. Um, what happened in this election? How, how did Donald Trump become president? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> listen, uh, listen. Okay, uh, honest uh, listen, No, 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 no. I, I, uh, I do have a theory on this. Uh, originally, I had supported Marco Rubio and uh, spent a lot of time on, on the trail. I thought he would have been a great president, and I hope that someday he does become the president. Um, but nevertheless, at, at the end of the day, this is my own personal theory on it. Having run for public office and won five general elections, I was a campaign manager to John Huntsman Jr., um, uh, who won uh, the governorship in, in Utah. Um, also a great man who ran for president, and I hope he gets a, a shot at some, at some point in life. Um, but here's my personal theory. People vote for who they like, who they know, and who they agree with on policy and principle. Now, if you get two of those three, they're probably voting to come in your way. And I think there is a degree of authenticity um, that is really, really important to people. I don't think you can fake your way through it. I'm grateful for the people like Dan Balls and others who shake that tree so hard on these candidates for a very long period of time. I think that's a really healthy, healthy part of the process. Um, but at the end of the day, my personal belief, I don't think the country as a whole, you may personally, I don't think the country believed Hillary Clinton. I, I think she lacked an authenticity. Her book is chock full of excuses. Well, I would have done this, I should have done this, I was thinking this, and I did that. Um, and like it or not, Donald Trump was speaking a language that a whole bunch of America thought, wow, that's really how I feel. I, you know, he's kind of that guy sitting on the chair yelling at the TV during the football game, saying, oh, you should have done it this way, you know? And that ultimately won the day. He was not part of Washington, D.C. He, he gave a stiff arm to Washington, D.C. And there's a huge part of the electorate that said, I don't want more Washington, D.C. I don't want somebody who's politically correct because I want somebody who's going to blow through the bureaucracy and get stuff done. That's, that's my take on it. He did win 30 of the 50 states. I mean, he won overwhelmingly in Arizona, for goodness sake, and he took the strongest stance you could possibly take on immigration. So I think he does feel empowered that he has a mandate to get things done. But his interaction with Congress and everything is a whole nother Whole nother equation, so. I'm gonna let Karen uh, go next since the, la the last job she had was working for Hillary Clinton, so let her rip, Karen. I'll go last. <laughs> okay. All right, who would like to jump in here next? Mark, please. Yeah, I think um, it, it was, it's an election we'll be studying for a long time because obviously the results were something none of us would have predicted two years ago. Yeah, I think, like Jason, uh, you know, I had, there were like 16 Republican candidates and Trump was like my 17th choice. <laughs> uh, you know, but yeah, having said that, there's this anger at both parties. 
They, they see them pl playing for elections. And so they're not going to govern. They're just going to angle for the next election. And then every once in a while, someone gets, hits a trifecta, which is 60 votes in the Senate and majority in the House and the presidency. You know how many times that's happened in my lifetime and I'm 61? Three times. That's it. It was Lyndon Johnson's first full term on his own, 60, which was, they passed a lot of things, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, Medicare. It was Jimmy Carter's first term. <laughs> he, he ended up vetoing 32 bills passed by Democrat Congress, so it didn't work out too well. Uh, and it was Barack Obama's uh, first two years, and not even get the full, full two years, because when Senator Kennedy died, he went down to 59. But if we're going to wait for once every 20 years for Congress to get something done, we're not going to have a very satisfactory situation. There are times when Congress has worked together well. When President Kennedy was president, he passed what at the time was the largest tax and cut in history, and he did that with both parties. When the Civil Rights Act passed, when the Voting Rights Act passed, when Medicare passed, it was a majority of both parties in both chambers. Congress can work together when it's not such a polarized environment. Now, what Trump tapped into was there's a group of Americans who, you know, we actually did a survey of people who voted for Barack Obama in 2008, uh, 2012, and then voted for Donald Trump in 2016. It's a sizable group. Most of them are people who are not very political. They are, for a large part, males t age 25 to 55 without a college education, who are working class people. It's the only demographic group in this country whose life expectancy is going down. And the three major causes are suicide, cirrhosis of the liver, and accidental drug and alcohol poisoning. These are desperate people that they feel they're not being listened to. They feel that no one in politics listens to them. What Trump was smart about was tapping into this group in a way that I think maybe was against everything we came to expect from our politics. Uh, but he did speak a language to them that he, they believed someone was listening. Now, that's always great to be able to talk a language to somebody. It's actually performing that actually makes a difference. And now we have a situation where a person who tapped into this anger you know, was able to get power. But what happens if this anger continues? Who's next? Where do we go? This is why it's so important. We stop worrying about the next election and taking every issue and figuring out who's going to be in power, like we are a parliamentary system, because we're not, and start working on getting things done now. We have a right to expect a functional Congress that passes legislation on a bipartisan basis. Uh, it, you know, it is, I think you're absolutely right, the system designed to work by consensus. We don't do well split 50-50. We work w well when we get a consensus of people. That's why we've only had 17 uh, amendments passed since the original Bill of Rights in 240 years. Because on important issues, we believe the American people should be united. We either get back to that, or we, the expectation will be the future is we will have leaders increasingly becoming more uh, demagogic, who will increasingly be appealing to let me solve the problems. I'll make you secure. You just support me. And why should we be exempt from history? I keep coming back to that. Either we get serious about governing now and becoming more bipartisan or nonpartisan, or the future is not going to be very bright. Um, I just want to mention again, if you, if you want to ask questions, you should step up to the microphone so I can see you. Um, Dan, is, was this last campaign, um, this presidential campaign, is, that, is this the new normal? Is President Trump the new normal? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, um, I mean one of the questions that I've posed for our study group is, you know, we're either in the most you know, abnormal moment in our recent political history or we're at the beginning of a new normal. Let me go back to your, your original question about why Trump won. I mean, one of the things that you know, somebody who does what I do does at the end of a campaign is to, particularly one in which the outcome was different than you anticipated, um, is to go back and say, what did I miss? Um, what was out there that, that I either overlooked or underestimated or didn't believe or whatever? Um, and there were, there were a number of moments, but there were a, a couple uh, that stand out to me. One was a focus group that Peter Hart, a uh, brilliant pollster and focus group person, did in January of 2015. This was before Donald Trump was really on anybody's horizon other than Donald Trump's. And it was a focus group of, of Republicans, Democrats, and independents in Denver, uh, in one of the Denver suburbs. And one of the things that came out of that is 
at one point he kind of went around the room and said, how do you feel about A or B or C? You just give me your quick reactions to these people. It's a, it's a way to kind of get you know, at a gut level what people's impressions of possible presidential candidates are. Um, for Jeb Bush and for Hillary Clinton, the reactions were very, very negative. More so for Jeb Bush. That was the first really early warning sign that Jeb Bush did not have a future as a presidential candidate. Um, but also for Hillary Clinton. And, and part of it was a reaction to the idea that we should not have political dynasties in this country. That this country was big enough and had you know, so many more people that two families should not dominate our presidential politics. You know, that, that did stay with me, uh, both as a problem for Jeb Bush and as a problem for Hillary Clinton. I mean, it was one of those things that you could see early on that, that even though she was quite popular as Secretary of State, that once she got back into the political arena, there was gonna be resistance to her and that she was gonna have to figure out how to overcome that. The second episode or the second early warning sign I went to Britain in June of 2016 for the Brexit vote. And the night of the Brexit vote was very similar to the night of our election, which is right at the beginning, um, the, the feeling in Britain among all the smart people was that the, the Remain side was gonna win and that the Leave side was gonna lose. And then the first two constituencies or districts results came in. And in both cases, they were bad for the Remain side and good for the, for the people who wanted to get out of the European Union. And as you know, that narrowly, that narrowly passed and the Brits are now in this process of trying to get out of the EU without losing their shirt. Um, and I wrote a piece the day after that that basically said, you know, we should remove from our political lexicon the notion that it can't happen here. Um, Again, not saying Donald Trump's going to win, but, but we ought to set aside the idea that, that Donald Trump, who at that point uh, had extraordinarily high negatives, he had just become the effective Republican nominee, but he had extraordinarily high negatives. All of the smart people and a lot of the polling suggested it was going to be a very difficult road to, to the White House for him if there was, one, if there was a road at all. And yet, that was, that was a reminder that there was, you know, as, as, as we've said here, there was an anger that had built up in that country and this country toward political elites. Part of it was a frustration with the absence of functional government, but part of it was a sense of being disrespected, disrespected by political elites, by cultural elites. Um, and there is a considerable part of the population who feels that. I've been out and around the Midwest a lot this year talking to people about kind of what happened in districts that switched from one party to the other. Um, and that's, that, that's not the only element, but it is an element. I think that the third factor, and um, Karen can agree or disagree with this, um, is that, that two problems that, that Hillary Clinton had beyond the fact that, you know, next to Donald Trump, she was the least uh, popular presidential candidate in modern history. Um, one was the absence of an affirmative message on her behalf. Um, she, I mean, the, the campaign did some work on this, they tried at times, but there was never a kind of an overriding message that worked, and too much emphasis went into trying to disqualify Donald Trump. And at a certain point, that argument lost its potency. Part of the population had said, we're never going to vote for Donald Trump, but there was another part of the population that for that argument, it wasn't, it wasn't enough. There had to be something else, and, and she wasn't able to do that. And the other problem was um, that the, the Obama coalition has proved not to be transferable to other Democratic candidates. We saw that in the midterms in 2010, we saw that in the midterms in 2014, and we definitely saw it in 2016. I would say I agree with both of the things you said. And uh, although, Jason, I was going to ask you if you've read the book, because you certainly have a lot of criticisms, and I don't think you've read it. I don't think you know what's in it. So let's read it before we start saying what she did or didn't say. Because I will tell you, one of the things she says very clearly is, it was this, it was that. You can point to anything you want, and you will all be right. But I was the candidate, so it's me. It's on me. It's my fault. I made the decisions. I also personally believe 
There is nothing she can say, no amount of apology she can make that will ever, ever satisfy everybody. But I believe she deserves to have her say because she is the first woman in the history of our country to be within a hair of becoming president of the United States of America. And if we don't think listening to that perspective is valuable, then shame on us. Because I'll tell you, <laughs> what I think there's a lot of in the book is lessons learned. I mean, there was, you know, one of the excerpts that's been released was her talking about the feeling of the menacing of Donald Trump on the stage, right, when she, during that one debate. And I remember when she re first ran for Senate and Rick Lazio, if you're old enough to remember this, approached her, walked over to her podium on the stage. I saw her Secret Service agents were like, what's he going to do? And everybody felt this very strange reaction. And that was in the 90s. All the male reporters thought, oh, he's such a badass. He did what he needed to do. He was tough. They checked in with their dial groups. And women were so turned off that within an hour, the story about what had happened in that debate really changed. So to see that kind of play out again when she's running for president, but to not see the same kind of reaction, I thought was really interesting. And so part of what I will say is, you know, I'm happy to, I will gladly tell war stories about the campaign and what I really think. I'll give you a short answer now. We made a lot of mistakes. There are a lot of decisions I personally didn't agree with, but I don't choose to talk about them uh, publicly because I don't think that's right. Uh, secondly, I think there are a number of reasons that we lost. We all knew Hillary was a, f a flawed candidate. Let's put that aside for a second. I think there are, and this is part of what we'll discuss in my study group, a number of trends and realities that I think are still valid for exploration. This idea that perhaps the Russians hacked our election, may have tried to influence or undermine our election. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican or independent, that should scare the hell out of you. Because you know what, they were effective. I mean, look, we are still talking about it, right? And there is still concern. And there's stories coming out every day that say, well, actually, the more we study it, it looks like this or that may have happened. We better get that right before the next election. The second thing I would say is I think sexism and misogyny was very much underexplored and undiscussed. I had a, a, a dear friend who's an African American say to me the idea of a, a woman at the top of the ticket is, doesn't really count as diversity because it was Hillary. What? But, but some of this stuff really plays, I mean, there is something about Hillary that I think engendered, I agree, I mean, it's very strong reactions. I saw it in 1990, I worked for the women since 1992 off and on, and I saw it as first lady, she was someone who was very much, and in many phases of her life has been on the cutting edge and the tip of the spear as women's roles have been changing. And I think our country has to take a real hard look at whether or not we trust a woman to be the chief executive of this country. There's a Harvard researcher here who says we don't. We don't trust women with power. So I think that's something to look at. The last thing I'll say goes back to something I said before. I am deeply concerned. I mean, you were talking about Donald Trump and what he said to people. Four studies now have shown the top voting concern if you chose Donald Trump was not the economy. If your top concern was the economy, you voted for Hillary. It was fear of diversity. Yes, it is true, and I'll show you the studies. All right. It was fear, let me just finish, my, let me finish my sentence, though. Okay. Was fear of diversity. And part of what some of that, what those studies have shown is that for some people, when they talked about being afraid that their kids wouldn't have the same opportunities, it's because of the changing demographics of the country. And I think, you know, we, I wrote a piece about this. I feel very strongly about this. As a country, we've got to take a hard look at that as well. We are a changing, diverse country, and I think it has been underexamined and underexplored that we got to get comfortable with that and learn how to live with each other um, because we're not. If there's, you know, we are de in this election, demographics were not destiny, but it will be at some point. And the last thing I'll say is I agree with Dan very much that the Obama coalition of voters. I say this as a warning to my party. Actually, they are more like swing voters. They are not Democratic Party voters. Barack Obama was very wise to create uh, Obama for America outside of the DNC because he understood those folks were Obama voters. They weren't Democrats. Um, and I think we have to understand that. And I think my party has not done a good job of understanding that. All right, thank you. OK, we're going to go to questions now. Um, I would ask you to identify yourself. Make sure there's a question mark at the end of the question. Yes. 
sorry? I have a, I have, part oh. of my new job is I have a relationship with Fox News and I'm a contributor and television is not very forgiving on the time. So I, I'm like one minute past the time going, but I, I can stay for just like three minutes and I'm gonna have to go. Okay, All right, you can stay for a couple more yes, minutes. Yes, I'll right. hear the first question. All right, Yes. go. <laughs> Is it on? Okay. Yeah, good. My first question is kind of for you and also for Mark. Um, so I'm an undergraduate, I'm a freshman, my name's Hannah Ellery, and um, as I was walking back to my dorm from class today, I walked through a protest. Uh, now you've seen a lot of protests in the early months of Donald Trump's presidency, from the Women's March to the Climate March, and it seems to me that they have a lot of um, galvanizing power for the left, but I was wondering what they look like from the right. Do they galvanize the right? Do, do you listen to those protests? Um, I, think, I think we've seen more of the right protests. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we've been this, we've been this up there. Um, uh, I love the fact that we get, I, here's what I believe. I believe that younger people need to get more engaged, not less engaged. Yeah, we listen to those protests, of course we do. I want more people involved in the political process, not, not less. I mean, the message I keep trying to tell people is so few people raise their hands, but those that do, they make all the difference. And they, of course they need to do it. Many of you don't know this about my background, but I'm actually kind of loosely related to the Dukakis family. I was the co-chair <laughs> of Michael Dukakis for president in Utah. All three of us were working hard on that campaign back in the day. <laughs> now, I, I was in my late teens, but I remember Governor Dukakis talking passionately about we need good people on both sides of the aisle. I think it's safe to say he was very encouraging in my running for Congress. And when I sent him my first brochure to see what he thought, and he said, I disagree with everything in there, I thought, yeah, this is gonna work in Utah. <laughs> so, um, look, we, I really do believe that. I really do believe some of my best friends are on the Democratic side of the aisle. And I want people on both sides of the aisle working hard, debating issues. That's how we get to the best solution. I'm not necessarily gonna agree with you. I'm not necessarily gonna vote for it. But what we lack in this, in this country is more vigorous debate. It gets synthesized down to you know, 30 seconds of that, 20 seconds of that. You know, one of my great frustrations with the Senate is they're supposed to be the most deliberative body on the face of the planet. When do you actually see them debate? They never do it. <laughs> and, and so do I listen to those debates and those, uh, to the protests and all? Yeah, I think they're very impactful. And there's a lot of things that you'll learn from it if you're open and honest with yourself. So I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on, I wanna have more and more people involved and engaged, and I hope you and everybody else here, the very fact that you're here means you probably are more engaged, but I do worry about the millions of people who you know, don't listen or don't participate in that process, and somehow, some way, we gotta get more people involved, not less. All right, I'm gonna go My to apologies next. for having to go, but thank you. I'll go be ahead. around thank for the you. next couple thank months, you, so thank you so much, Trevor. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, side now. <laughs> you're, you're holding the right flank. <laughs> Hi, I'm Allie Wiener. I'm a joint degree student here in the MPA oh, right, program okay. with Stanford oh, Business oh, School. We're in Utah. Uh, so um, first, I just want to say I'm very glad you're all here. Um, my question certainly is for you, Secretary Jewell, but also for those of you who have spent more time in politics. I'm curious, for business leaders who want to support a progressive agenda, where do you see their role in this administration? Is it useful for them to be partnering, to be joining the resistance, to be doing something else? Thanks. Well, I, I use this phrase fairly often. I learned it when I was at REI and I was talking to members in Congress. Um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And um, so there are many, many business leaders that uh, want to see that effective balance, that want to leave a future. I would say, argue, we all want to leave a future for generations to follow that we're proud to leave for, uh, to them. And I think if you, if you aren't engaging, um, you can't expect other people to carry the water for you. So I think it, it is very important for business leaders to engage. The first guest that I will bring in from the outside, which is actually in the second session, is you know, business's role in the future of our planet. And I've asked Doug Rausch to come and join me. Uh, he was senior executive at Trader Joe's there for many decades. 
uh, has now formed a nonprofit that takes uh, leftover food um, from a variety of sources and uh, provides it to uh, people actually in lower income areas throughout the city here so they have access to, to healthy food, foods and vegetables in, in places like um, you know, food deserts. And at any rate, uh, he and I worked together when I was CEO of REI and, and uh, he just left Trader Joe's on something called conscious capitalism. There's been some research done about the uh, performance of companies that actually um, embrace a, uh, an agenda that is about people, planet, profits, triple bottom line, all of those things. Treat their employees well, their customers well, think about their environmental footprint. Um, and all of those things actually drive healthier performance and, and shareholder value. So uh, I think that you will find many businesses moving more in that direction because consumers demand it. And I think that there is increasing activism on the part of consumers to align with brands and to support brands um, that they are, are proud to be associated with. So I think all of those things will be uh, very, very important. And I'm seeing more businesses speak out um, than ever before, including, and I, I'm sorry Jason's left on this point because there's something that we disagree on, which is the National Monuments uh, Review and one specifically which was in his district called Bears Ears. The um, outpouring of engagement by businesses who are part of a uh, over $800 billion outdoor recreation industry, it's a huge number. It's actually bigger than pharmaceuticals about as big as pharmaceuticals, motor vehicles, and motor vehicles parts combined. That's how big the industry is, but nobody's heard of them because they haven't been active. And uh, I've said, guys, this is time for you to step up. Uh, you, your businesses depend on a healthy environment. You know, you're part of the solution, but if you don't uh, speak up, you can't expect uh, others to not be at the table. And uh, so I think it is very important, and I think that there are a lot of progressive business leaders out there who are uh, bringing their voice to the table sometimes for the first time ever. Thank All you. right, let's go over here. Uh, my name's Louis Goundon. I'm a student. Uh, and my question to all of you is, we get a lot of rhetoric around partisanship and fixing politics. Uh, my question is for each of you, in as brief as you can, because uh, I know you all like to talk, and you're all very good at talking. <laughs> but I would like each of you to pick one thing. There's a lot of things you could pick, but what is the one thing you would pick to fix politics? The first step, you would go to fixing politics, to making it better, making it more bipartisan. What's the one thing you would choose, and what's the first step you would take? All right, well, let's let uh, Johannes take that. And, and just as the young man said, let's, so everybody can answer, let's be brief. Go. Appreciate it more. <laughs> I'll be extremely brief on the fix. Uh, money. <laughs> now, how to get to the fix, I'm going to be slightly less brief and say uh, you need a Supreme Court that agrees with you. And the route to that Supreme Court is <laughs> through the Democratic Party right now. And that's a fact. Next, Dan, you want to try it? I don't think there is an easy fix, um, but I think that if there is to be a fix, it has to begin ultimately with the voters. Um, we can talk a lot about how Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill ought to work together and how the, you know, the nature of that process ought to be better. Um, I think our campaigns have contributed to the polarization that we have, and I think that we now have an electorate uh, that is not just polarized, but hostile one side to the other. And until those attitudes begin to change, I don't think you can really ultimately fix the problem. Mark? Well, I would go with demographics is get rid of all the baby boomers. <laughs> you know, I, re I really think there's actually something to that, that um, the baby boom generation is so black and white, yes and no. I mean, it's, it, they're, they're the ones where they're the protesting at a Tea Party rally or the long-haired ponytail professor who's leading. I mean, they're just angry all the time. You know, and I actually am a contrarian. I believe that millennials are actually one of the best hopes for the future of American politics. And I'll tell you why, why I learned this example. I was an adjunct at George Washington University, and of course, we, like every other university, we had our quota of Marxist professors. And, uh, but they were, perhaps one professor said, I can't get these kids to fight with one another. I throw something out there, and, and they end up agreeing with each other. 
<laughs> and I said, yeah, because they don't like hostility. They like consensus. They're trying to build something. They want to make more positive. So I think what we need is to rush younger people more into the political system. I think the, the exact opposite is happening. They're being turned off by the politics today. But man, I mean, if, if you have one mission here at Harvard is to get more people like yourselves involved, and it doesn't have to, you don't, don't try to pick which issues they should get involved in. Just get more people involved because I think we have to get back to a politics where we are trying to reach consensus, where we agree on what the problem is. Right now, we, we, have, we are all acquiring our own sets of facts. I mean, everyone's contributing to this problem, whether it's in the media, whether it's the politicians, whether it's the voters. I, it, we have to get back to more consensus-based politics because if we're, if we're going to just fight with each other, the system will break. Secretary? I don't have a lot to add to what's, what's been said. I, I mean, I think money is a big part of the problem. Uh, I also have hope in this generation. And, and frankly, if there's, I, I was not a Trump supporter, probably not a surprise. Um, but uh, that was for emphasis. But I do think if there's a silver lining in um, having a uh, President Trump, and, and I'm particularly as a woman um, horrified by his behavior and, and how that some voters found that acceptable or could hold their nose and vote for him anyway, that it has um, enlightened people as to the responsibility as voters. And um, I think that, I mean, it's, it's a moment to seize, and I hope we seize the moment. And, uh, you know, I'm with Mark um, almost on a, I mean, a <laughs> lot of things, and I think we're going to find this uh, among ourselves, that um, uh, we really need to seek opportunities, and I'd say you need to seek opportunities to enliven your generation, which is larger, by the way, than our generation. We just discovered I'm like six weeks older than him. It's kind of a bummer. But uh, <laughs> we're boomers, and I think he's right. Uh, anything to add, Karen? I'll just say money. Money. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Over here. Good evening, my name is Aziz and I'm a first year here at the Kennedy School doing my master's in public policy. So my question is in regards to the division within the Democratic Party, how do you think the party should regroup ahead of the 2018 midterms and what should it strategize in terms of its policies? Should it move to the left to consolidate the integration of Bernie voters or should it continue on its current path of being in the center? Thank you. Um, Johannes, I'm going to go to you again on that. So. Um, <laughs> Wow, that's, that's hard to follow. Um, Let me spill my water. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, look, I think um, I, I'd make a couple points here. One, personally, I would reject some of the false choices that a lot of people have propped up as to you know, the, the most obvious one being you know, whether or not the party should lean into an economic message versus reach out to minorities. That's a total false choice that people have tried to foist upon people upon the party, and I think it's to the detriment of um, our chances of future success. Uh, as a funny aside, and I would challenge you to do this, people who push that false choice, ask them where, which one they would choose right now, and compare it to what they were choosing before the election, and it's invariably the same. They've had the same view pre, post, election. It's not any soul searching, it's just sort of a subscription to a long held view on where the party should go. So I'd stay away from false choices. The next thing I would say is I wouldn't look to, I would not look to DC for leadership and I would not look to the, infra the infrastructures that we have in place for leadership. One of the things about movement and organizing is one of the things we'll talk about in my study group is that you can't predict where it's gonna come from and when you try to control it, you invariably mess up. And if we've proven anything over the course of the last two years is that not only do we not have a monopoly of wisdom in DC amongst people who are ostensibly political professionals, but oftentimes we are way off. We, in, everybody on this stage was wrong about what the outcome of the election would be. We have to, I mean, let's just be clear about that. And I would argue probably 70% of the people in this room were wrong as well. And so I would not look to, uh, yeah, I think Tom Perez is an amazing DNC chair, by the way. I think he's doing a great job and he's a good friend. And I think we definitely should look to him for leadership, but not exclusively. Leadership's gonna have to come from a whole lot of different places. And one of the best things I've seen since the election is that You've got groups like Indivisible 
who were created by people who had really never been involved in campaigns before. They're Capitol Hill staffers. They had never organized anything before, and they've now created an entire national movement. And ha you know, half a dozen or a dozen of those are going to rise and fall over the course of the next year and a half, and that's healthy. We're not in smoke-filled backroom territory anymore. That's not how the way our politics work. I think the more that you know, sort of the elders in our party appreciate that and create room and space for young people to innovate and build new infrastructure for the party, the better we're going to do. I'm going to do one more round at each of the mics, so go ahead. Hi, my name is Umbari Nahal. I've uh, served in the Medicaid program as a medical director and also led some uh, national grassroots campaigns. So I just wanted to follow up on that question in terms of how do people sitting in a Harvard University, given a culture of devaluation of an expertise, and more, how do, how do people in this room show authentic leadership uh, and, you know, take, uh, maybe even compensate for the fact that they come from Harvard, because typically in the past that's been that's given you more authenticity, or at least more authority. But at this time, actually, I think there's a lot of pushback against it. So what to kind of follow up on the earlier question? Something not just money as a concept, but something actionable, concrete, actionable. Who would like? Okay. Because I want to build on something that Johanna said, which is also something we'll talk about in uh, my uh, study group. It is so, the, the, the activism that is happening right now is so exciting and I think one of the big questions is how do we go from moment to movement and make sure that the groups that can sustain over time do sustain over time? And I, so I think part of the answer to your question is be a part of what you're passionate about. If it's healthcare, then, then find the right organization that is advocating for what you believe about healthcare because I think one of the things we're finding right now is that People are engaged about what they care about, um, and I think that's where you can have the greatest impact because obviously it's what you're passionate about. Um, and I also think all of this activism is fantastic because I personally I agree with Johannes in that, I, and I say this as somebody who works for the Democratic Party, I think that we need to be creating more pathways for engagement and activism, and I think we need to, I think the political parties need to figure out how to work in partnership rather, because too often it's co-opt. How do we co-opt Black Lives Matter? How do we co-opt Indivisible? Instead of saying, respecting what you've built and saying, okay, let's, how do we partner together and understand that we're gonna be aligned on some issues and some places we're not, and that's okay. And I think that also goes to the other question, that this point about false choices but I really think you've got to focus on building on what you are pa most passionate about because that will come through, um, and I think you'll be most effective that way. Yeah. Oh, Mark, go ahead and then tell it. One of the things I've learned already, as you can tell, we, we have a wide variety of views here, is that I, I really like these people, and even though I politically don't agree with them a lot, you know, that's the same thing at my Thanksgiving dinner table, there's a lot of people I disagree with, is that we all have all these common experiences, but we disagree on some issues. You know, I, this anger is what's so poisonous in our politics. Why should you be angry at somebody who, because they're smart? You know, you stop and think of, that's an asset and a resource. Large degree, I think we're going through a change in the parties in the, because you have, I think you have at least two major coalitions of the Democrat Party. You have the sort of center left Clinton legacy from Bill and Hillary. You have Bernie and, and, uh, and Elizabeth Warren on one side. I think there are at least four coalitions within the Republican Party. So the Ryan Republicans, which are left over from Reagan, and the Trump populists, the Ted Cruz, Freedom Caucus guys, and, and then there's like, uh, you know, Rand Paul's out there by himself there. But, <laughs> but, you know, we have like these, I always tell my European friends, you form your coalitions after the elections, we form ours beforehand. Uh, but I, I think to form a coalition, you have to be able to compromise with people, which starts with respect. And we gotta start respecting each other a lot more in our political system and, and understand that people disagree with you, that Karen and I can disagree on issues fundamentally but still appreciate each other as people and what we have to offer to each other. And I would love to see her, if, if Hillary Clinton won, I would love to be the fact that you would be in the higher level of government. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't right. excited about Hillary winning, but I would love to have her be there if she did. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Rosa and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and I'm also one of 10.2 million undocumented immigrants who do not have DACA. Um, and so when DACA was implemented, Obama and his administration still continue to deport and separate families. And there seems to be this narrative that only the 800,000 DACA recipients are deserving of congressional um, action. And some of you kind of fed into that narrative earlier when you were talking about DACA. And so my question is, how do we change that narrative and how do we push Congress to protect all undocumented immigrants, not, the, not just the dreamers, quote unquote? 
Uh, Sally? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in, even though this isn't necessarily my area of expertise. But um, you know, as, as I said earlier, I was a business person. And uh, part of my career journey was spending 19 years in banking. And a big part of that was working with uh, businesses involved in agriculture. Um, but also, you know, manufacturing, building trades, you name it. If it was not for undocumented immigrants, uh, we would not have the economy that we have. And there's very few things that I agreed with George W. Bush on, but this is one area that I think he really understood. And I think one of the fundamental things we have got to unlock, and, and I did hear a little bit of it up here, is I'd like to see <coughs> the business people, the agricultural lobby in particular, but that's just one element. I mean, you could say this for a number of industries, come forward and say, these are our workers. We are dead without them. We will not eat uh, the way we, we are now. We will not have the price of products that we have now. Um, we would not have the support network in the hotels, and I'm sure uh, that the President of the United States, being in the hospitality business, um, is far more dependent than he is aware of on undocumented uh, immigrants as well as documented immigrants. So uh, this is something that um, I'm, I'm an immigrant. Uh, my mother actually was born and raised in India, and this is very different than the DACA situation, so I don't want to equate the two, but when after partition and she moved back to England, she was, her citizenship was not honored even though her mother was born in England and her father was representing the British government, she had to reapply for citizenship. And when we immigrated here, she held on to that citizenship, the UK citizenship, for a very long time because she was afraid to be a woman without a country again. So, I mean, this is, um, it's fundamental to business, and I just wish the business people uh, would speak up about the importance of immigrants to our economy because if they did that, this would not be a partisan issue. But this would be something that we would address, and we'd address it in a humane way and in a sensible way. We'd allow guest workers. We'd provide a pathway to citizenship. And we would remove the uncertainty that is, is now in your life and the lives of your family, because we would take action that would recognize what drives the economy of the United States. All right, we have two more questions um, here. Uh, hi, I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, I was wondering, people have talked about this already, but what can I do like in the next seven days on this campus that will make a meaningful impact on particularly DACA legislation, but more generally, I guess, the legislative path that <laughs> Uh, Congress takes? Like, is there any, especially considering that most people in this room have an affiliation with Harvard, how can we utilize that connection to the institution, especially, in order to affect change? <laughs> well, look, look, I think it's a great question. I would, the one thing I would challenge you on is that anything that's worth doing is hard and takes time. So I would not, I would not think about it in, in short increments. Every single fight, including the fight for an immigration system that's compassionate and makes sense is gonna be difficult and take time. So I appreciate that, you, that, your, that your sense of urgency, but one of the things you gotta also realize in movement is that we've got a lot of fights to come over the course of the next few years. And you have to you know, uh, kind of have that mindset and realize that change is gonna come slowly, no matter how hard, even when you run hard. I would say specifically what you can do, part of it's gonna be a little bit tied to your geography, where you're coming from you know, whether, you know, what your home state affiliation is. Uh, Mark is, you know, on, on the panel, and basically in the country, the expert on the, what I'm about to say. So I say, I say it with like the appropriate humility, but um, look, members of Congress listen to their constituents. And to the extent to which you are from a district or next to a district or in a state that has uh, a member of Congress who is wavering on future legislation, any future legislation that you're interested in, you can organize remotely. It's one of the beauties of the moment we're in. Organize remotely. I would, I, there, there's not a person in this room, no matter how politically active you are, I know it's certainly true of me, and I would, I would challenge anyone to say otherwise, where if you went through your Facebook and picked your 100 closest friends and family, 
could guarantee me right now that they all voted in the last election. I know I couldn't. So there's actions you could take from your dorm room as soon as you get back in terms of educating them about the issues you care about, and it's particularly important if you're from a part of the country where you have members of Congress who are wavering on elections that you care about. All right, last question. Hi, my name is Laureen. Uh, I'm a baby boomer, and I am an independent. <laughs> I am an independent, and I became an independent on 9-11-01 when my 23-year-old son was uh, killed on the 105th floor of Cantor Fitzgerald. I want to talk a little bit and ask you if any of you remember the lobbying that the 9-11 families did. We went to Washington twice. My husband, who was with me, and myself were part of the steering committee. And we did organize, and we all of us were not of the capabilities of what this beautiful organization of Harvard offers to this country. And there, I mean, we went first for the 2004 when President Bush would not give us the 9-11 Commission. He wouldn't give the country the 9-11 Commission. And then we went for JASTA. And I'd like to just say that there is a way that you do lobby and there's a way that you do organize. And it's something that all of you here at Harvard can help your students and teach all the community to do. I wish that the representative had not left because we drove his committee nuts. Because he, they were the committee. And we lost our bill for the first nine cycles. And last year in September, we were in Washington again. And you know what happened. We overrode the JASTA bill on President Obama. Whether you agree with what we did with the legislation or not, we were a group of basic, everyday Americans. We were a 9-11 community that went to Washington and made a difference. And when they wouldn't listen to us, we had a database that would just clog their system up for days. And I think those of you that worked in the government knew that you really didn't want to see us coming and you didn't want to hear from us. That to me was a success. That's the American way. So all of you, I just ask, talk to your professors. See how you can organize. It's that, not that hard. It's not that hard to visit your legislation, uh, elected officials, and it's also not hard to learn what committees are taking the legislation and go to work on them. Learn their uh, legislative aides. Talk to them every day. So please, can you talk to the young people about that? We can make a difference. Thank you. Baby Thank boomers, you. we were a lot of them. <laughs> Thank you for your insights. Um, before we wrap this up, I want to let you know you're all invited to a reception in the IOP right through that door over there. Um, and um, let's give our panel a, a round of applause. Thank you all. And that's it for tonight.